is going to give us uh, an introduction to network analysis. So please, uh, welcome Adam. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, everyone, for joining me today. Uh, quite a nice turnout, more than I expected. I expected 15 to 20. Um, a note on housekeeping beforehand. I didn't realize that yellow means don't photograph me, so feel free to photograph the slides or me and or uh, approach me later because uh, I'm happy to share the slides and the code and I'll probably put it on GitHub at some point. Now, um, <clears throat> today we are going to talk about network analysis in Python. Um, network analysis is a huge topic. We only have 25 minutes to go today. Not enough to even scratch the surface. There have been previous PyCons where sessions and workshops lasted between three and four hours uh, just to get people introduced with Python uh, network analysis. We only have 25 minutes, maybe 24 left, so my objectives are rather modest. I'd just like to show you how useful network analysis can be, and I'd like to show you that it's easy to get started. By no means this is going to be comprehensive. Our plan for today to achieve those two goals is to do a brief in theoretical intro. We'll analyze real data, build a real network, show you, uh, learn by doing, and then Finally, we'll explore some useful and interesting examples that will show you how applicable network analysis is to different disciplines. What we want to do in sake of time, uh, we want to dive deep and we want to be covering a lot of the different ways that you can do different things. We'll do no mathematical formulation, there will be no Greek letters, no matrices, no nothing. Um, and we want to deep dive into theory. And the thing about network analysis that you should remember is that results are often intuitive but the algorithms together are not. And we don't have the time to dive into the algorithms, and frankly, uh, not a lot of people understand them quite well. So at the end, I'll add uh, links to uh, further resources like the, those uh, workshops that I mentioned. So what is network analysis anyway, and why should we care? Let's start with the why should we care. Networks are everywhere. They, are, they affect our di lives daily. We are parts of more networks than we realize. Uh, it's not just Facebook. We'll see later some examples that include how networks influence us uh, finding a job, finding a spouse, finding anything on Google, uh, how to detect bot or troll networks on Twitter, um, deciding which banks to bail out if there is a financial meltdown, like a decade ago, um, personal recom personalized recommendations, and of course, surviving a zombie outbreak, which is a definitely a real thing. So what's a network analysis? What Wikipedia has to say in one very common sense of the term, a graph is, a ter is an ordered pair, G, v, uh, V, E, comprising a set of V, vertices, nodes, and so on. That's the long way. You can read better than I do. Let's do a watered down definition. Watered down. We keep it simple. Points and lines. Okay? <laughs> that's, what, that's what you need to remember today. If you can draw a conceptual relationship between any two objects, it's likely you can model them as a graph. So, <clears throat> some examples. Um, to points and lines. Points are people, lines that connect them, are, could be friendship, could be following. Companies trade with one another or acquire one another. Bus stops could be those points, and the buses that go between the different bus stops could be those lines connecting them. And you can also think about passengers moving from one bus stop to another as those lines. Um, Uber lifts on Ofo bikes uh, are uh, also points, so anywhere an Uber uh, picks up a fare and drops him, that could be a node or a point, and then the trip done by passengers. Countries trade, they have flight routes with one another, and most importantly, well in Europe, Eurovision points. There is a lot of network analysis on how countries uh, vote for one another in the Eurovision Song Contest, and we'll definitely see that in the end. And Wikipedia articles. So I don't know about you. I suspect that many of you uh, have the same experience. But when I just go on Wikipedia to try just learn what, just one thing, look up just one thing, I find myself surfing between one article to another because they are all linked to one another and they are all so interesting. So different articles in Wikipedia could be those points, and the link between them could be the line. So the obvious example, just to get it out of the way, Facebook, there's a guy, there's a friend, they have a con uh, relationship, they use a, um, they are friends on Facebook, that girl has other friends, the guy has other friends, it's a network, pretty straightforward, right? 
Um, those points and lines have more formal names, depends on the discipline. So you could call them nodes and for the points and edges and links. This is common in computer science and this is uh, what we'll use today mostly. Um, vertices and edges in mass, sites and bonds in physics, and actors and ties or relationships in sociology. Personally, I'm very excited about the sociology part because um, the, you can really see some really cool things about how the world works uh, in everyday life with, uh, with network analysis. That's pretty cool. And we'll use the, the formal terminology. Um, some main types of networks, the undirected ones, or simple ones, Facebook and LinkedIn are, are a common example. So connections are, are mutual and reciprocal. So if, if I'm your friend on Facebook, you're also my friend on Facebook. And uh, there are also directed networks like Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, whatever the kids are using these days, where if I follow you, it doesn't mean that you necessarily follow me. So there could be a direction to that uh, uh, network. To that. And there are also multigraphs and multidirected graphs. It basically means that you know, there could be multiple connections between any two nodes. So if I send Marco uh, messages on Messenger, then every message could be counted as one line. So that's a multigraph. Okay, so that was the brief theoretical introduction, points and lines. Uh, the best way to learn something is to get our hands dirty. So this is what you should do. You should pip install Network X. Um, Network X is uh, probably the most popular uh, way to study networks in Python. It's comprehensive, it's, uh, it's API is friendly, there's good documentation that also doesn't only explain how to do something, it also explains the logic behind it, which is useful. Um, and this is PyCon, so we need to use Python. The shortcomings of Network X is scalability to very large graphs, so kind of rule of thumb. When you hit around a, a million nodes, that's where things get clunky and to visualize very large graphs. There are other options like Snappy, GraphTool, iGraph, and Gephi, which is not Python, um, and just as reference. So what's our example? <clears throat> we'll use real data from Venmo. Anyone familiar with Venmo? Okay, if you're not. So Venmo is a peer-to-peer -peer payment app in the US. Uh, it's owned by PayPal. Basically, if you go out for dinner with your friend and you want to split the bills and one friend, your friend can pay for it and then you can Venmo or transfer the money to that friend. And the thing about Venmo is that um, there are public transactions, so anyone in the world can see what you just paid and to whom. Um, and you can see that online in nearly real time. You can see, I mean, the, the, this is a, a little small and blurry, but you will have to trust me that you can see transactions between two people. So what you can see here on top, or again, trust me, Leonard paid John, so that's one set of notes. Hunter paid Brian, and there's an emoji of a scooter for whatever reason, Hunter Brian, and Erica paid Monica for dinner in Barbados. And there's also Taco Bell over here. So if you go to Venmo.com right now, you could see real-time transactions of people. Let's go make Python run. Exciting part. So this is where we were. This is the, the, the basic network. Um, so the first thing to do is to import network X. It's commonly imported as an X. We also import parameters, collections, and matplotlib to, to visualize, and some other stuff. So how do you get started? That's the point of this talk. It's really, really easy to get started uh, with Network X. You can create an empty graph with nx.graph. Pretty straightforward. Um, and in order to populate the graph, we can just pass a list of tuples. So earlier we saw Leonard and John, Hunter to Brian and Erica to Monica. That's what we pass, a list of uh, tuples to populate the graph. Add edges from uh, is the method's name. And G is not defined because I didn't run anything so far. So let's call that. Let's define G. And there you go. So we have our network. And let's visualize it so you'll see there's really a network there. So pretty much the same illustrations that I, I did in uh, Google Slides. Hunter to Brian, Erica, Monica, John, Leonard. Fair enough. Pretty straightforward, we got our first network done in what, three lines? 
Um, but that's obviously not very interesting by itself. Uh, so let's do it with some more data. Um, if you snoop around the internet a little bit, you'll find a larger data set from, for Venmo transactions. And um, we'll read it that using Python, Network X can handle more, uh, a lot of data types like JSONs and pickles. Let's, let's read it, it'll take oh, two seconds. We'll call it a payments DF for data frame and we'll explore that. It's pretty straightforward for the sender ID and receiver ID. Um, all data that I show you today has been obfuscated uh, for obvious reasons. Um, and, and yeah, so, so that's, that's our raw data to work with. And the way to build a network from uh, a pandas data frame is to use the from pandas edge list. You pass the data frame, you define the source and the receiver, and the, re the reason you do that is because data frames obviously can have many, many columns, so you need to specify which ones do you want to use, and we'll create using a digraph or directed graph, um, which is what I mentioned earlier because there is a meaning for the direction of the relationship, x sent y um, money. So let's do that. It's happening, it's happening. There we go. So we loaded the network, um, created it, and populated it with uh, edge info from the data frame. We have 700,000 nodes and 600,000 or so uh, edges. And we will do the same thing that we did earlier. We'll visualize the, the network, why not? So uh, in sake of you know, resources and time, I'll just kind of uh, show you what I had prepared earlier. That's a very, <laughs> very useful network. Um, so what we can do, it's not very useful, so what can we do? We can visualize it some, in some other tool, or we can zoom in into one sub-network and see what we can learn from that. And I suggest we'll go with the second one because it will be easier to get an intuitive understanding of what uh, the concepts are and what networks look like. And again, resource heavy, and that's not the point of today's talk. So how do we look at a sub-network? How do we look at a subgroup? We'll look at something called connected components. Basically, connected components are just a subset of the nodes of the original network where there is a path between, uh, between nodes, which means you can start at one node and reach another node by just walking on edges. And there are no other paths, there are no paths to any other nodes in the network. So everything is closed. So a simple example would be what we have here. So these are two connected components. There's Dan, Melta, and Donna, Jane, John, Stacy, and Becky. Two separate connected components. If we drew an edge between any node here to any node here, then it would become one connected component. Fair enough, makes sense? Pretty straightforward. So how do we do it in uh, Network X? Fairly simple, we'll use weakly connected components, I won't dive into the nuances here, uh, but basically NX connected components or NX weakly or the, uh, strongly connected components, we'll do that. And I, uh, I'm using a counter here to, to, to be able to say a few things about the connected components. And you can see that the largest connected component in our data is, has over 18,000 members, okay? And that's quite remarkable if you think about it. You have data taken from the real world in the wild, and there's a huge component of it of more than 18,000 people that are somehow connected to one another. Think about it. If you send your friends uh, money on you know, Venmo, or I think in, in the UK you can use uh, Monzo or other services, you are somehow also connected to a huge uh, population of people that you can theoretically reach via your connections. And the top five are what they are. So let's zoom in on one connected component, and very conveniently I cherry-picked one in sake of uh, showing you how it's done. Um, so basically these are just IDs for nodes and I can use the subgraph method of 
an X, which basically takes the original graph and just focuses, zooms in on certain nodes by keeping and while keeping uh, the relationship and the attributes of the original graph. So it's pretty straightforward, and we have 40 nodes and 78 edges. And let's visualize what it looks like. Okay, this starts to, to look interesting, I'd, I'd argue. So we can see that it's an interesting network because there are a few groups here that are more tightly knit, right? There's five of them, tight knit groups. And there are also these nodes in, in the middle that seem uh, more central than others in the sense that more, uh, more traffic goes through them or more payments go through them. That's an interesting way to start, I think. So <clears throat> we'll add the user ID so we can explore a little further. That's amazing. And since that's not very uh, interesting, let's also add uh, node attributes with the names. So nodes can have attributes, graph can have, have attributes, and edges could have attributes. We'll just read them from another, uh, another data frame. Completely bogus data, by the way. We see uh, a data frame where there's a user ID and there's a first name and a gender, for example. Um, and in order to, to add that to the, to the graph, we have to turn that into a dictionary, and pandas is great, so it won't be a problem. And we'll use the set node attributes method. Pretty straightforward. So let's do that, and let's see that it actually worked. So in order to look at uh, a, no a specific node's attributes, let's just use uh, by the way, I called the, the subnetwork gsub. Makes sense. We'll just gsub dot nodes and then pass the ID. And we see that the first name is Felicia, the gender is female, just as we saw over here. So, <clears throat> and you can also you know, get node attributes for all nodes and specify the first name, for instance, what attribute you want to see. So to add that to the graph, Fairly straightforward. This is the only thing we need to change. All right, we have names. Now what? Now let's do something more sophisticated. Let's detect the communities. We said that the groups that seem to be more uh, tightly connected to one another than to other groups. Let's see if we can do it. So communities um, are pretty much group of people that have tightly knit groups, tightly knit connections to one another, and not so much to other groups. So if you think about it, you have your own group of friends, other people have their own group of friends, and you are not a member of their group of friends, they are not a member of your group of friends. You can both live happily with your own group of friends and you know, sometimes run into one another out in the city. So that's the idea of, of communities. Um, and there are a few ways to go about it. We'll actually use an external library called Community um, that uses the Levine algorithm. Network X has its own algorithm based on the Gilvan Newman approach. Um, again, for, for sake of time, we won't dive into how that works. But one way to, to detect communities is to just uh, kind of remove edges and see what happens. So if you're a tightly group, uh, a tight group of friends and you remove one edge and you could still, you know, you can still find your friends and you can still connect with friends even if one direct edge has been removed. But if you are, if you have, you know, a weak connection to another group and you remove that, then that's it. So what you need to remember is that probably um, tight group of friends have the and communities have a lot of relationships between them. Anyway, We'll run that and visualize. And, and you can't see much, I guess, but you'll see that our suspicions have become uh, true. So we see that this group of friends is called one color purple. This is greenish. This is another shade of purple, yellow and green. So, all right. So we'll now need to find a way to rank our nodes. Um, in sake of time, I'll kind of breeze through these. There are different ways to um, uh, rank nodes and see which one is more important than the other. There are centrality measures. 
the basic ones, the naive ones say a node that has more incoming or outgoing edges is more important. And there are more complex ways to look at it, like not all nodes are created equal. So if you have uh, important people connecting to you, then you are more, more important than if you have less important people connected to you. We'll just, we'll just visualize it really quickly using two things, using between a centrality, which, um, which looks at which nodes are in the middle of shortest path. Um, and I apologize that I don't have enough time to look in to explain further. So we resize the nodes by their relative importance and we'll use PageRank, which is what Google uses for another visualization. Which again shows more important nodes are bigger than the others. Okay, so, so why? What should, why should you care? Okay, here's the crux of the talk. So let's say that you are uh, a customer support agent at Venmo, okay? And you have two calls coming in. You have one from Brandon and one from Alberto, okay? Whose phone do you pick up? Whose call? You're probably going to want to call to answer Brandon's phone or, or Todd's phone call because you want to keep them happy because they are most central to your product and to your network, okay? If Alberto churns and stops using the product, that's one thing. If someone central that connects different communities churns and doesn't use your product anymore, that's a different issue. So you should prioritize, for instance, if you're a customer support service agent, by the importance of the node in the network. And there are other uh, examples to look at, like, or other ways to think about it, like um, product managers that might like to uh, develop a new, a new feature with the help of important nodes, um, marketers that could direct their uh, attention and budgets into specific nodes and because those uh, main nodes are connected to other nodes, if you target the, your message to the important nodes, that will percolate to <laughs> other nodes in the network. Make sense? Um, so let's see some examples, okay? Because I promised you a Eurovision Song Contest and I'll provide it. Um, the one thing that you know you must uh, you must always uh, 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 talk about is the strength of weak ties. Basically, seminal work by Mark Granovetter, a sociologist. It was cited 50,000 times, so it's big. Uh, basically, he showed that the way to get a job or a spouse is by leveraging your weak ties. And so those groups that are strong ties are tightly knit, but they also have <coughs> weak ties that connect between them. And uh, the idea here is that you know pretty much everything that your friends know, but if you want new information like a lead on a job or someone you might want to date, then you need to leverage your weak ties and, and look at other groups because you don't have the information that they have. Make sense? Reddit karma cheaters. Um, so this was something I saw uh, at a, a talk in San Francisco earlier this year um, by Reddit CTO Chris Slow. This is data I generated, but one minute. But basically, the, the, the way to catch cheaters is uh, people that upvote to one another and not to the biggest group. So they, have, they are more tightly connected if they just upvote one another's posts. To, to raise their karma. Likewise for, for Twitter votes and Eurovision. Okay, so there is an amazing tool called the Eurovision Voting Examiner. You can just, it has data for like 30 years of Eurovision Song Contest. All the, the points sent by one, one country to another. So you can see we have um, interesting communities here. Um, basically all the former Yugoslavic countries vote on one another and Ah, it's very hard to read. And UK and England, Ireland and so on vote for one another and, and anything that you would expect all the former USSR countries vote for one another. Anything that you would expect there and you always say, ah, it's so biased. That they always vote for one another. That's exactly it. There's proof with uh, network analysis. <laughs> Thank you very much. You've been great.
you have questions, uh, come ping me. You can, will you be around for the rest of the conference? I'll, so I'll, I'm around until uh, Monday. Until Monday, so if you have any questions on network analysis, you can approach them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan, one more time. Thank you.